Hey guys, it's been several years since I made my most popular video, which is how to become a voice actor. And over those years, I've grown in wisdom and experience, and I figured it's about time that I remake that video. And I'm going to intentionally not watch that previous video because I don't want to subconsciously absorb that information and then just regurgitate it to you. I wanna come at it with fresh perspective and fresh eyes. And a lot of the information is going to be the same because the method is still the same and that video is still very relevant. But in the case that some of my perspectives may have changed or grown, then I wanna give you that information as well. And then hopefully you find benefit between the two. So I'm going to break this video up into a couple different parts. I'm going to tell you technically what you need to do to become a voice actor. I'm going to give you a little bit of perspective in how the industry functions so you can kind of understand uh, what you're dealing with when you're trying to figure out how to navigate. And then I'm going to give you some more insights and personal perspectives and my thoughts that I think will maybe sound not relevant to you at the moment or you might not know what to do with the information but it very subtly helps influence your decisions as you're moving forward just by having that kind of perspective so let's get into it all right so the very first thing that you need is a recording studio and I have mine built out in this entire room, but you don't need an entire room to have a studio. You could be in a small closet space. I have a traveling studio that I travel with whenever I need to record on the road, and the sound quality is equivalent to what I'm getting in this room now. So it's very possible for you to work with where your limitations are in terms of space and put together a studio that really works for you. Now, if you want more information on the specifics of that. I have some other videos on this channel. I have one where I'm doing an interview with my personal audio engineer who is also here on YouTube that educates about sound engineering and things like that. His name is Lenny B and I'll link all of the videos down below so you guys can go ahead and watch them. But in that interview, we talk about materials of how to build your booth, ways to think about you know, dealing with the sounds and reflections in your space, all of that kind of thing. I also have several videos where I have built out multiple studio spaces for myself over the past couple years that might help give you some ideas in how to approach your space. Now the sound treatment is the most important thing for you to invest in when you're first getting into voiceover. And it happens to be the very first thing that you really need to work on when you're getting started. And uh, you'll find in my other videos, I talk about the importance of that, how important it is to deaden and sound treat your room over even the equipment that you will be using. So that's something to keep in mind and it will be a process to get there and it's one of the biggest hurdles to getting started and it's the very first step but once you've got that down then you're already leagues ahead of someone who doesn't have that treatment. Now, along with a sound treated studio space, you're going to need equipment. And here is a list of all of the equipment that you're going to need from the microphone to the microphone arm to a microphone cable. And I have them all listed in my Amazon storefront if you want a place to just kind of browse and see how all of the see how all of these pieces are going to fit together. But in short, you're gonna need a microphone, you're going to need an interface that that microphone plugs into, and then your interface is going to plug into your computer, and then you're going to need software for recording. So now that you theoretically have your studio all set up with all of your equipment set up and hopefully you've taken some time to figure out how to use your software i also have videos on how to use your software and get started with recordings and a little bit of information on processing but a lot of that information you can find on lenny b's channel where he goes in depth on processing and mastering the audio the raw audio that you're recording but once you have all of that then what's next well, what's next is you're going to need a demo. Now, I will say I know that a lot of you who are looking into this information will be pooling information from many different people and resources, and you might have some people arguing that you have to go to school or take classes or do workshops. I never did that when I got started, and I'm doing just fine, thank you. So. 
what I did was I decided to jump into the deep end and get my feet wet and get experience. I knew how to read out loud and I had been doing it for many years, you know, reading to my younger sibling and things like that. But I waited until I was full time and very profitable before I even signed up for an acting studio. And then I was at that acting studio every week for three years. There's definitely a craft to it, but what we're focusing on now is getting you profitable and getting you working. And it may or may not be surprising to you, but there's many actors who find themselves in an acting studio and then it becomes a safe space and then it becomes a crutch for them not to just get out there and start booking work. You will never feel ready or fully qualified to get into it until you get that experience. And experience means a lot. So in this video, I'm focusing on just jumping into the deep end. And for that, you're going to need a demo. Now, your demo is your calling card. Your demo is like a miniature portfolio that you are trying to circulate to as many ears as possible to show what you've got. And in the world of demos, there are structures to the different types of demos. The most important demo you will ever have is your commercial demo. And I also have videos like that on my channel where I talk about the structure of a commercial demo. And I think I have one for audiobook as well. You can have a demo for virtually any category in the industry. You can have a demo for commercial, e-learning, corporate, character animation, which kind of covers animation and video games. You can have a demo for audiobooks, uh, basically whatever you can think of that feels like a, a slice of the pie in the industry, you can make a demo for it. And some people go wild and they have tons and tons of demos. So when you approach having a demo done, you could pay quite a bit of money. It's going to, if you get a top tier demo producer, you're going to be paying between $2,500 and maybe $3,300 to produce your demo. If you're just getting started, I highly recommend making your own. I made my own and it did very well for me for a long time until again, I was fully profitable and full time in my career and I knew that this was something I was going to stick to. Only then did I invest in getting a very professionally made demo. So like I said, your commercial demo is going to be your most important demo, unless you're the kind of voice actor, which they're out there, who only want to focus on audiobooks. That's the only thing that they're interested in. In which case, you can make an audiobook demo and, you know, gallop off into the wind with that direction that you know that you want to move into. And the audiobook demo is actually one of the easiest demos that you can make. So, you know, you can knock the, both of those out in the, you know, same time frame that you're going to be working on putting your demo together. But when it comes to your commercial demo, I'll give you some of the basics. You're going to want about five spots, none of them lasting more than 15 seconds each. And they don't have to be all the same amount of time in each. You're going to want to pick different categories of the commercial industry, whether it be technology, food, retail, things that are you're interested in and things that also fit with the demographic of who you are and your voice, because that is what you're going to want to capitalize on, your own unique person and other people who are like you that you would be hired to be speaking to through the commercial. So you're going to have maybe about five spots. You don't want the demo to be longer than maybe a minute 20. One minute is really ideal. And you're going to want to show a lot of variety in your tone, a lot of variety in the spots that you're picking, choose different types of music, and move forward from there. If you have any questions, I recommend you go watch that video. And if there's anything that I didn't answer between the two, go ahead and let me know. All right, so you have your studio, you have your demo, now you want clients. And this is by far the most asked question. This is where everyone tends to get really hung up on how to get the work. And there are many different resources to find work in voiceover. So we'll cover a couple of the umbrellas in which you could find work and talk a little bit about the nature of that. So first and foremost is probably the avenue that you have already heard about, which are platforms. Pay to plays are what they are often called because oftentimes you need to pay 
for the privilege to have access to clients and auditions to book gigs. Now, in the past, I've spoken about this. For platforms like Voices.com and Voices123, there is, uh, I'm trying to remember exactly. I know one of them, there's an annual subscription and they also take 20% of the earnings for each project that you book. And that can range from hundreds of dollars a year to thousands of dollars a year just in the subscription to that service. Places like Fiverr.com, which is where I kind of grew up in the industry, at the time when I got in, there was no option to have to pay money to be on that site. So it was free and Fiverr would take 20% of my earnings and then a percentage from the client as well, which was more akin to how agents function and I was okay with that. By the time that I left platforms, Fiverr was starting to integrate an SEO optimization option where you had to pay like $30 a month to be able to be optimized and uh, it is what it is. Some of the pros and cons with pay to plays are, I'll talk about the benefits first. It's a marketplace where you are in front of people who are actively looking for you. So that makes it so easy whenever it's like a fishing pond and all of your opportunity is sitting right there and you don't have to go and try and find each opportunity individually. One of the cons about that is you're standing shoulder to shoulder with a lot of people who are trying to do the exact same thing you are doing. So now between all of you guys, your rates are going to be kind of dictated by each other because you have to be competitive with each other. But you also have to try and find a way to really set yourself apart because the competition is going to be so fierce just in the volume of people who are competing for the same jobs that you're competing for. One of the other things to consider with that is if you're just starting out and you're on a budget and you're just trying to see if you can make this work, it's a lot of money to put down on these pay to plays just to see if you're going to be able to book a gig. If you're paying $500 for the annual fee on Voices.com and now you're auditioning but you're not booking any of those gigs, that's going to be a lot of money down the drain if you're on a tight budget. So that's something to consider, which will bring us to our next avenue of one of the resources to book gigs. Agents and managers. I won't talk about managers, they're not gonna be relevant for you for a long time, so I'll focus on agents. And these are people who do this all day long and are deeply embedded in the industry. They are more relationship-based with each of the clients as opposed to in a marketplace where it's just a free-for-all. Agents are really curating their client list. So I'll go through the pros and cons of working with an agent. Some of the pros are you are going to get a higher price point for the projects that you're working on than you're really going to ever be able to negotiate for yourself. Agents, that is what they're professionals at. Advocating for you, the talent, and to have someone advocating for the rate that you're worth as opposed to you trying to advocate for yourself to the client gives a really nice buffer to where you can just relax and know that you know you're not going to take any resentment or the client isn't going to feel any way about you personally because of the rate that they're paying no one ever blames the talent for their rate they look to the agent and that's when they negotiate and once they land on something they're happy with you can show up and every and it's a clean slate with you and that feels really nice so agents will negotiate a really great price for you some of the cons are you can't just walk into any agency and get representation and not all agents are created the same you have agents all over the nation, all over the world, who are at different levels, with different focuses, with different connections. So you are going to have to figure out and find an agent that works for you, that also wants to sign with you. And you're also not going to expect the same amount of volume in audition opportunity with an agent than you would on a platform. On the platform, like I said, it's a free for all. Everyone has access to these auditions. So the competition is very high, but the volume of opportunity is also much higher. Whenever it comes to agents, it's whatever that agent is able to bring in in terms of audition opportunities and send your way. So some people will have multiple agents in different regions and there's different rules 
rules to that kind of stuff as well. But that's the world of working with agencies. And the final umbrella that I will talk about in terms of booking gigs is self-marketing. And this is the umbrella that nobody wants to hear about. Everyone's eyes kind of glaze over when I talk to them about it. But it really is important for a sustainable career in the industry. And it's cold calling and nobody wants to cold call. It's kind of like nobody wants to be the person knocking on doors down a neighborhood trying to sell security or like Spectrum Internet or something like that. It can be a little bit nerve wracking to call up somebody that you don't know, ask them for their time and try to get them to listen to your demo so you can get on their roster. And then eventually, perhaps you might hear back from them with an opportunity to audition. Also, people don't like cold calling because the success rate is incredibly low across the board with people who cold call. And I think whenever I looked at the statistics, it was maybe like a 2% success rate, which means if you call 100 different companies, maybe two of them are going to say yes to you. Back in the day when I was tracking my statistics, my success rate was like 11%, which is incredibly healthy for uh, that approach. But I also was very meticulous in how I approached people as well. So uh, whenever you're approaching cold calls, basically what you're doing is you're thinking about who in the world might ever have use for a commercial demo, whether that's marketing agencies, whether that's video production companies, whether it's casting directors, um, who else might need that kind of stuff, specifically in the commercial demo realm, you know, like radio stations, stuff like that. You just really want to get creative with who might need your services. Then you start looking for those companies in those areas and you can break down your structure of how you want to approach that in any way that you can, whether you break it down by city or whether you just type it into Google and start calling people that pop up on the Google search list. And basically your only intention is to get them to listen to your demo and ask them if they'd be willing to consider you for their roster. So whenever they have an opportunity pop up where they need a voice actor, if they have an internal roster, then they look at that internal roster and give you an audition opportunity and then you're off to the races. Okay, so those are the three main legs technically that you need to get started. You have your studio, you have your demo that you're gonna circulate, and now you have your approach of how you're going to go about trying to book gigs. Now I wanna talk a little bit about uh, considerations for how to present yourself. So I have a website, I obviously have social media, TikTok, Instagram, and I have a portfolio on my website of things that I've worked on. And this is where you get to really infuse your personality into the face of your business and how you're going to present yourself to the world. A lot of people ask me if they have to have a website. And the thing about this industry is, is there is no have to, or there is no should or could, or, you know, I mean, there is could, but there is no right or wrong way to approach the industry. It's all based on what you're capable of and what you're willing to do and what works for you. I personally think that it's really important for voice actors to have a website. I don't personally know any voice actors that don't have their own functioning website because that is your online portfolio. Yeah, your demo is kind of like your calling card and it's a snippet of your portfolio, but your website is really where you have an opportunity to make yourself shine. So I collect all of my uh, real projects, as many as I can from projects that I've worked on with clients and oftentimes they're in video form and I use that to put on my website so you can see real work that I've done. I use my website to host many of all of my demos on there. I build out separate pages for specific areas of the industry so if I'm trying to get an audiobook or if I'm trying to get into an audio drama I have a whole page from the audio dramas that I've actively worked on so whenever a potential client in the realm of audio dramas is kind of looking into me and seeing who I am, they can see a whole page of something that's directly relevant to them. I also put my client lists, the biggest name clients that I've worked with on that website. So it's really 
uh, about credibility. It's putting your best foot forward and showing what you've done and what you continue to do and how active you are in the industry. Now, you know, you have to pay for a website, and I know that that's some outside of some people's budgets, or you don't have much of a portfolio to put together because you're just getting started, and that's fine. Especially if you choose to be on a platform, then your platform really is kind of like your pseudo portfolio. But I would say social media is free, and I think it's very important. In today's world, if you aren't online with your business, you virtually don't exist. So to have some social media where you're active, where it's focused on what you do, I think would benefit you. And that can also serve as your portfolio, as you're kind of building momentum before you invest in a website. And lastly, I will address two questions that I think often come up in one phrasing or another. One of them is, does it matter where you live? And the answer is yes and no. There are so many opportunities and so many different types of clients that there's never going to be just one flat answer that will apply across the board. But I will say that mostly the answer is no, it doesn't matter where you live. I record from my studio in Austin, Texas all day, every day, and only once ever have I had to go into the studio, which was actually in Austin City. Other than that, you know, I work at all levels of the industry and I do it all from home. The only times where it does matter where you live are in very specific circumstances. And that's usually in L.A. or New York. It's usually with things like video games or animated shows. And part of the reason for that is both of those cities are chock full of actors who are more than happy to meet the client where they are. And a lot of those clients have studio spaces already, so they prefer for you to come in to have that human interaction and to work in that fashion. And there's no incentive for them to work with someone who's across the country when they feel perfectly fine with the talent pool that they have in their own city. But that being said, in today's age, you absolutely can have a full functioning business without worrying about being in any specific location. And the second thing that often comes up in one way or another is Whenever you're getting started in the industry, oftentimes there's this inclination of wanting answers to be very clear. Is it this way or is it this way? Is this the right approach or is this the wrong approach? And what I can say, which may be comforting to you or it may not be, is there is no right or wrong way in the industry and everyone has an opinion. So I've taken many workshops in my years as a voice actor. I've taken workshops with casting directors at Disney and creative, you know, talent management at the top tier agencies in the nation. And what I started to find was everyone gives you answers that feel so concrete and so black and white. And then you'll go over to another workshop with someone who is just as experienced and qualified in the industry, and they will say something that directly contradicts what you heard over here. And I think part of the reason for that is is that agents and casting directors and producers, um, they get questions all day long about how to succeed in the industry, and they want to have an answer for you to feel like they're providing that value of what you want to know so they they give you their opinion and they give you what they see has what they've seen has worked in the industry and it sounds very black and white because that's the reality that they're standing in but it really is more gray than anything so there is no absolute right or wrong way to approach an audition and there is no absolute right or wrong way to reach out to clients and try to book gigs it's really like a create your own adventure where you have to figure out what your style is it's going to be a lot of trial and error to see what works for you and what doesn't all right well hopefully that gave you a really good foundation to get started in the industry and if you have any questions i'd love to hear them and i will see you guys next time